Uh, Carl, thank you very much. Uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to uh, be here and to be able to uh, talk about Barrett's esophagus, um, which is really one of the most exciting uh, conditions in esophageal surgery because it's so controversial. Um, what we're going to, my disclosures are such, I was a participa uh, participant in the randomized uh, Barracks uh, dysplasia ablation uh, trial, which was published last summer in the New England Journal. I wasn't paid a penny uh, for this uh, work. Um, I did have uh, lunch today with some very good folks from the Barracks uh, Corporation. Uh, I did pay for my lunch. I want you know, <laughs> I was a little more healthy than what I'm showing. And, and indeed, I really can't remember how to spell barracks, um, but I, I think I've got it right. I think it's two R's and one X, uh, but I've always spelled it wrong throughout my history. Um, Jeff showed you a lot of d data about the uh, epidemiology of barracks. I think one of the things to point out is how much, um, how much the data varies depending upon who you look at. Um, at the bottom study seen here is a study from the VA population uh, done, I think, in, at Stanford showing that 25% uh, percent of people in that population age uh, greater than 50 uh, had Barrett's esophagus, and if you use that as an estimate, it would be 20 million people. At the far other end of the spectrum, uh, this uh, study uh, shows that 1.6% uh, or 3.3 million uh, people uh, might have Barrett's. And even if you accept that this is the, the true estimate of Barrett's, uh, that's a whole lot of patients out there uh, that need screening, uh, and ultimately I agree with Jeff's surveillance, and perhaps uh, a large proportion of them will need some sort of treatment. Um, and, and this is the problem uh, that we are failing to correct, which is the problem of the growing prevalence, uh, growing incidence of esophageal uh, cancer. Uh, it is the growingest uh, cancer of all uh, cancers, uh, outstripping uh, even melanoma and prostate uh, with a six and a half fold uh, increase between 75 uh, and 2005. Um, and uh, that, of course, is linked to reflux disease. The second question I was asked was who should do it. I'm going to deal with that one first. Uh, because I think the answer is pretty clear. Any skilled upper GI endoscopist who practices interventional endoscopy should be able to do this. Um, and uh, while much of the early developments of the, in this uh, technology were done by surgeons, uh, this is largely being done uh, by gastroenterologists now, uh, but both have shared in the developments, and, and I'm, it's uh, exciting to see surgeons uh, get excited by this. Well, who should have it is sort of the next question. And I'm going to deal with this in three phases. I'm going to deal with it in the spectrum of Barrett's esophagus, uh, t um, and that t uh, takes us here, sort of at this uh, stage uh, of the disease with erosive esophagitis. This is the Barrett's, uh, and we can't tell looking endoscopically at this today whether this is just metaplasia, low-grade dysplasia, or high-grade dysplasia. Histology is still necessary, but there's no doubt uh, that we recognize this as invasive cancer uh, once we cross this sort of magic dotted line. Um, and, but histologically, it's very easy to tell what the differences are. Um, and this, uh, for those of you who haven't looked at, at much Barrett's under the microscope, is a very orderly uh, organization of glands with goblet cells. And this is just nasty looking. This is high-grade dysplasia. And there's very little inter-observer ver um, variability uh, in defining these two conditions. Low-grade dysplasia, on the other hand, which I haven't shown you, uh, does have a fair amount of inter-observer variability and ought to be looked at uh, generally by at least two uh, pathologists, unless you have a real skilled one at your institution. Um, this slide, I'm only going to direct you to the yellow line because the yellow line shows you the natural history of high-grade dysplasia. This is uh, uh, f uh, from uh, uh, Brian Reed's uh, work at uh, um, the Hutchison Cancer Center. And the, the, the line basically follows a trajectory of about 10% uh, uh, migration from high-grade dysplasia to cancer or d uh, progression uh, over the course of an uh, eight-year period. So 10%, 8 to 10% per year. 
Um, and just showed you a little bit of this data, but the, there is a high rate of discovery of invasive cancer in esophagectomy specimens when high-grade dysplasia, seen here as your preoperative diagnosis, and your operative specimen shows invasive cancer. And if you just confine yourself to studies from the 20th, 21st century, with one here from the uh, last decade of, of the previous century, you see that the rate of uh, finding cancer in esophagectomy specimens is pretty high. Uh, and uh, Tom Rice's study here sh uh, shows that while 80% of these are still mucosally confined, uh, there are a significant proportion, 20%, uh, that are at least into the submucosa or deeper. Um, and if you multiply 0.2 times 0.5, you realize that about 10% of patients with a preoperative diagnosis of high-grade dysplasia have disease greater than T1A, so disease that is really essentially out of the, out of the reach of, of uh, ablation therapy. So this is all very relevant to the discussion we're about to have. Uh, so what's the natural history of the other two conditions I said I'd talk about? And Jeff showed you a little bit about this, but over the course of 10 years, 25% uh, of low-grade dysplastics have converted to high-grade dysplasia or cancer, uh, and probably about 10% uh, or one-fifth as much uh, of the no dysplastic. So the odds ratio of, of cancer progression for the low-grade dysplasia is about six times what it is for those uh, with no dysplasia. Uh, his, this is sort of a, this beginning of the slide is a little bit of history. The management options for high-grade dysplasia used to be surveillance or esophagectomy. Uh, and against that background, now uh, we have endoscopic mucosal resection for nodularities, which you'll hear about from Dr. Inouye next, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, ablation. Now, photodynamic therapy was really the first uh, successful ablative strategy. Quite a number of us, and I got a SAGES grant years and years ago using the argon laser to do ablation, and it was very difficult and very inadequate. Uh, so I'm not even going to talk about that because photodynamic therapy supplanted the uh, laser ablation that we were doing back in the 90s. Uh, and a, a randomized trial that Gene Overholt uh, did uh, showed that uh, here that um, photodynamic therapy was capable of eradicating uh, the intestinal metaplasia in about 75% of patients as opposed to the control group here with 39% eradication. Uh, and it about cut the progression to cancer in half at five years uh, with 15% in the PDT plus PPI group and in the control group 30% had developed cancer after five years. And here you can see the Kaplan-Meier curves of those two groups. Um, the uh, PDT, while successful, uh, was, uh, creates some problems. And the two major problems uh, are stricture. 30% of patients got stricture, uh, and 65% of patients got photosensitivity. And uh, the growth of RFA has really put a nail in the coffin of PDT and such that the balloon catheter is not even available in the U.S. anymore. So the uh, um, radiofrequency... Uh, balloon ablation has taken its place. Uh, it starts with a sizing balloon uh, that sizes the esophagus. An appropriate sized RFA balloon is then chosen, which uh, applies energy. This is some of the early studies uh, that, that we did uh, showing, um, I think Dan Smith, this may be one of Dan's uh, specimens, uh, showing uh, the normal squamous epithelium, an ablation zone, a non ablated zone. Uh, another ablate, ablation zone, and the histology associated first here with the Barrett's uh, and here with the area that has been uh, ablated. Uh, and it found, it, again, in the early, day, early days that 70% of Barrett's patients uh, had no um, Barrett's or no intestinal metaplasia at, at uh, one year. And this prompted a, the study of high-grade dysplasia, which I'm going to take you to in a minute. Some of the problems uh, with the balloon device uh, was that it left islands uh, behind, especially right around the GE junction. Uh, and so this 90-degree uh, uh, device uh, was developed to, to uh, spot weld, if you will, uh, um, islands of uh, Barrett's that were uh, left. And this is uh, some, some uh, size of, from Charlie Lightdale showing uh, some Barrett's esophagus, clearly another area of uh, Barrett's esophagus. This is the balloon uh, with the uh, RFA um, coils before the balloon is inflated. 
This is essentially how it works. The balloon is placed. Uh, it's inflated. The, it's activated with about 12 joules per centimeter squared. It's deflated. It's moved to the distal uh, extent of the Barrett's uh, and inflated again, and uh, RF uh, energy is applied. And this is what it looks like uh, at the completion uh, of the uh, application. Uh, here's the uh, uh, Halo 90 uh, device uh, with a, a nodule uh, here in the application uh, of the uh, halo. Uh, and here are a couple of before and after. I feel like a plastic surgeon now showing you before and after pictures, but I'm going to show you a couple of them. Um, a baseline picture, this is two years after uh, RFA. Another patient baseline, uh, two years uh, post RFA. Uh, looks like a pretty normal esophagus uh, at that point. Now, there are a couple caveats and things to, to understand about uh, RFA. Uh, the RFA uh, is done with um, positive and negative uh, electrodes that are placed about a half a millimeter apart. Uh, that means that its depth uh, is really about the same length as the distance between the electrodes. So the depth of injury with RFA is only about half a millimeter to one millimeter of depth. Um, as opposed to PDT, which takes you two to five millimeters in depth. And this, uh, of course, PDT will give you a deeper effect, and people were initially concerned uh, with RFA that it wouldn't be deep enough. And if you can see that RFA will take you down into the submucosa or just about to the uh, uh, portion right at the level of the uh, muscularis mucosa, um, and I think that's yeah, seen here, uh, and the PDT will take you into the muscularis. Uh, and this is why you got strictures in 30% of patients uh, after PDT and why stricture is actually quite rare because it's, you just don't go deep enough to get into the muscularis, uh, which is what creates stricture. So there's clearly less strictures, about 1% to 1.5% strictures uh, with this device. Uh, one might ask the question is, are you going to be as effective at preventing cancer progression? Um, and or alternatively, actually, could it be better than PDT because you don't miss spots or can go back and pick up spots? And I think the truth is that if it is better, it's because you can uh, treat repeatedly uh, with, the, with the 90 device to touch up. Um, as I said, there may be better methods now using narrow beam uh, imaging, et cetera, for detecting and treating small areas of residual cancer. So what are the, the worries? One of the worries is buried glands. Here's a, a squamous uh, neoepithelialization, and here's some subsquamous glands. Turns out that that's a very rare entity uh, in the trial, that the RFA uh, trial that we published, um, and uh, it turns out not to be, uh, at, at least at this point, and when I say it's still a little bit early, at this point it's, it's not a significant risk uh, factor. But one of the things we can't do yet uh, with an endoscope is tell when cancer is in lymphatics. And when cancer is in lymphatics is a time when, when we really need to be a lot more aggressive. And if we had a way of non-invasively determining this, then we would know who needed an esophagectomy. The best we can do is just look at depth and use depth as a surrogate. And depth can be determined uh, both with EMR or with e really uh, uh, high um, frequency EUS. Uh, EMR, of course, is the best way to look at this. And, and patients, I'm just going to focus you on this group, when, they, when you have extension of your tumor into the submucosa beneath the muscularis mucosa, the rate of lymph node involvement uh, is actually at a level where we probably ought to be uh, thinking that, that, that uh, esophagectomy, uh, maybe with neoadjuvant chemotherapy, should be done. Uh, the, even with the early stage cancer, however, you can see that lymph node metastases are not unheard of. So this is a study that was uh, published uh, last summer. Uh, there were two surgeons involved with this uh, study, and we were grateful to have been involved. Uh, Blair uh, Job, uh, my partner at, uh, at or Oregon for a long time, uh, did most of the treatment uh, with Glenn Eisen, a uh, gastroenterologist uh, there. It was a, a randomized sham control design, two patients with RFA versus the sham, stratified by high grade versus low grade, and the length of uh, uh, tumor, four RFA sessions at a maximum, uh, and then a 12-month uh, crossover period. Primary endpoints were complete remission of intestinal metaplasia, complete remission of dysplasia at 12 months, single pathologist, and these are the secondary endpoints uh, that we looked at. Um, and these are the data that were reported. Complete eradication uh, was uh, 
occurred at the one-year time point in 83 percent um, with, uh, and this is the, these are the treatment groups and here are the control groups, um, low-grade dysplasia 95 percent, a little harder to completely eradicate high-grade dysplasia uh, in this group. Uh, disease progression uh, was, uh, was rare except, of course, in the control group uh, where you can see 16.3 uh, percent percent uh, progression as opposed to 4% in the treatment group. Note uh, here that the high-grade dysplastics in one year, 19% of those in the control group had progressed to cancer. And remember, we quoted you figures of about 10% per year. It was actually double that uh, in this trial. Um, so the, 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 these are sort of statistical uh, numbers of, of the number needed to treat uh, for this to be cost-effective, uh, 4, 12, 6, and 11. So this, these are all pretty low numbers suggesting this is cost-effective treatment. So in this uh, trial, uh, we were able to uh, show that there was a high rate of complete eradication of dysplasia in IM uh, and decreased disease progression in the ablated group as compared to the control. Uh, this is a two-year durability uh, data, which has, hasn't yet been published, but essentially shows uh, that it is durable treatment. In fact, using the HALO 90 uh, device to touch these things up, the complete eradication is even higher uh, than it was uh, at the uh, uh, one-year uh, time point. Again, high grade is higher to completely eradicate with only about 80 percent uh, eradicated. Uh, so does it, ablation reduce the incidence of cancer? This is, of course, the fundamental question we have to answer. Um, and uh, these are, this is a, 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 a slide that Nick Shaheen put together uh, showing, I'm just going to address you to the high grade and low grade that you can reduce by almost tenfold the incidence of cancer development in low grade and by about fourfold, or 75 percent, the development of cancer in high grade dysplasia. Um, Again, number needed to treat for this to be effective therapy uh, uh, seen here. Uh, there's been a lot of interest in what about the non-dysplastic Barrett's? Is it cost effective to treat uh, those patients? And uh, for the interest of time, I'm not going to take you through this whole mathematical ar argument that John Inadami is sort of a, a, a modeler uh, as well as a gastroenterologist and has done a lot of these uh, uh, effectiveness analyses. Uh, but I'll just bring you to two, two, uh, two points. We know that high-grade dysplasia ablation is, is a dominant strategy. And in fact, um, for about 3,000, uh, uh, it's, uh, I'm sorry, it's uh, at, at a level of uh, $3,000 per quality-adjusted life year, it's an effective therapy. Low-grade dysplasia is cost-effective if you can get greater than 28% complete remission, which that study that we, we did uh, showed. Um, and uh, actually, non-dysplastic Barrett's uh, is still cost-effective if you can get greater than 40 percent complete remission, even if you're going to continue surveying all patients. So, so it may well be that uh, we'll be treating not only the dysplastic but the non-dysplastic Barrett's. So just to summarize, uh, ablation is effective, um, about 95 percent at two years, low-grade more so than high-grade. Uh, PDT is shown to reduce the cancer risk by 50 percent. Uh, the uh, RFA balloon ablation reduces high-grade dysplasia cancer risk by 75 percent. It doesn't eliminate it. Um, it. The RFA balloon has replaced uh, PDT, and surgeons certainly can be involved. But the last, uh, last lesson here is that we still require intensive surveillance especially in patients with low-grade and high-grade dysplasia, even after balloon ablation because of this risk of cancer development. So, Now, I'd just like to finish by thanking uh, many of the people who have uh, helped with the trial and helped with this presentation, uh, Blair, uh, Glenn Eisen, Brian Fennerty, and Nick Shaheen, who was a great PI for this study, uh, Nick Shaheen for some of the slides, Charlie Lightdale and Lorenzo Ferry from uh, Montreal, and then to my wife, my daughter, and the dog, of course. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. <laughs>